Ethiopia, February 11th, 1855. This coronation ceremony was supposed to be for someone else. The man at the center of it, being blessed by the head of the Ethiopian church, was once an outlaw, a man of the people, who attacked nobles and used what he stole to buy food and plows for poor farmers. He's now the most popular leader in a crumbling empire. At first taken in by the royal family, then spurned, he raised a rebellion. And in the past three years, he's defeated all comers. In fact, his last enemy was a rival prince who set up this very coronation ceremony for himself. Pity to let all that preparation go to waste. He is blessed, the crown placed on his head, and now he must pick a royal name. Hmm. His mind thinks back to an old Ethiopian legend. In it, a king named Teodros would reunify the empire and bring about justice. So to fulfill that prophecy, he takes that name, Teodros II. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for continuing to help us bring history to the table. Before we begin, a quick content warning up top. This episode contains discussions of suicide, so viewer discretion is advised. When Teodros II came to the throne of Ethiopia, it seemed unlikely that he would be remembered as one of the greatest ever emperors. Oh, sure, in hindsight, it feels obvious that he'd become a legend. I mean, his origin story alone, becoming the bandit governor of a province, pulling Robin Hood antics, and marrying into the royal line before overthrowing it is like Hollywood-level stuff. And read any contemporary account of him, and it's clear he was a force of nature. An excellent strategist and battlefield commander, he was also personally accomplished in the Ethiopian arts of war. Plus, he understood power, getting the Ethiopian church on his side well before assuming the throne, and he was smart. Educated in a monastery, and able to read and write in Arabic as well as local languages, yet that passed as a minor noble didn't separate him from his subjects. Sometimes called the Barefoot Emperor, he was known to live in extreme modesty, and occasionally pitch in and help farmers work their fields. Despite having battled and deposed her family, he also treated his wife with kindness, and they had an extremely loving relationship. And at the beginning of his reign, he even, unsuccessfully, attempted to abolish slavery. So, given all that, who could possibly dislike Teodros II? Well, precisely the folks that tended not to enjoy Robin Hood figures robbing the rich. You guessed it, the rich. Specifically, the elites who had ruled semi-autonomously and didn't love these ideas of modernization and unification, especially under a former bandit with a weak claim to the Solomonic line. Regardless, by the 1840s, Teodros had foreseen the threat descending on his homeland. As an outlaw border prince, he'd battled Ottoman-backed Egyptian incursions. He'd even mounted a counter-invasion into Sudanese territory, where he'd experienced modern Ottoman artillery for the first time, handing him his only defeat. He'd also met European foreigners, particularly from Britain, and while he liked many, and even kept one as an advisor, he recognized the dangers that they and their missionaries posed. If Ethiopia was going to survive, he reasoned, it must be united and modern, with a reorganized military and institutions. The people also had to be on the side of the government, meaning that the abuses and excesses of the era of princes had to be curtailed. So Teodros went to war expanding his domain province by province, defeating rivals, and locking them and their family members as political hostages in a fortress prison. These campaigns went far better than even Teodros had hoped. His army was large and disciplined, with far more rifles than his enemies. His opponents, riven by division, couldn't stop fighting internally even under his threat. And finally, many common people welcomed his rule, believing it would end the chaos of the last century. By 1856, he'd either conquered or received submission of all Ethiopia, the nobility reluctantly bowing down, acknowledging him in the face of popular and church support. He reorganized the military, creating a rank and unit structure Ethiopia still uses today, and equipped his troops with the modern rifles he'd taken from his defeated foes. He also made the army and civil service professional and salaried, loyal to the central government rather than local lords. Yet this honeymoon period lasted only a few months. Because Teodros didn't just want to rule Ethiopia, he wanted to reform it. First, he instituted a series of local garrisons to watch over the provinces, but this meant raising taxes on an already oversqueezed peasantry who turned on him. He then antagonized the church with new taxes, and when it refused, seized church land and redistributed it to the peasants. And with these pillars of society souring on his rule, the nobles saw their chance. Many rebelled, often courting French and British support, in order to obtain firearms and artillery. Teodros would spend almost his entire reign suppressing rebellions, perpetuating the state of constant warfare he'd hoped to end. And ultimately, his authority rarely extended further than the power base of his army. Once he marched into one rebel province, another would take arms against him. 
And it was then that Teodros started to formulate his biggest idea, one that could unify and safeguard the country. There were, he thought, two major external threats to Ethiopia, the Ottoman-Egyptian alliance and European colonialism. So why not use one to fight the other? This was partially a plan he devised due to his good relationships with two Englishmen, John Bell, a longtime advisor, and British consul Walter Plowden. Theodros admired the British, considering them to be a culture of strict discipline. He also found Protestant missionaries more acceptable, as they often sent men with skills like engineering, marrying religious missions with development aid. He wanted modernization, especially modern firearms, but he didn't just want to buy guns. He knew that dependence was a trap. Instead, he wanted smiths to come and teach Ethiopians to make guns, and more. He wanted skilled workers of all stripes, a technological Ethiopia run by Ethiopians. He also wanted to form an Anglo-Ethiopian alliance, which would support a crusade against the Ottoman Empire, its Egyptian vassals, and the growing Turkish presence in the Red Sea. This crusade would unify his country fighting external forces and win him the European support that would shield him from colonialism. But while his goals soared, his rule became increasingly bloody. First, in 1858, his beloved wife died while he was on campaign. Always a harsh disciplinarian with a violent streak, one doesn't become a bandit chief by being a pacifist, it soon became clear that his wife had been a calming and restraining influence on him. Then, when his friend John Bell, another restraining influence, was murdered on a mission two years later, he had hundreds of prisoners beheaded in retaliation. When peasants rebelled due to an uncontrollable drought and famine, he made the situation worse by destroying towns and fields. Discipline in the army became fanatically harsh, including mass executions, and by 1865, he was ruling solely via terror. Which is when things came to a head, because in 1862, he'd written a letter to Queen Victoria proposing his alliance and given it to a British consul to deliver personally. But when the consul reached port, the foreign office instructed him to send the letter on to London and carry out a different mission in Sudan. When the letter reached the foreign office, it was labeled pending, forgotten for a year, then forwarded to India, where it sat a second year. Teodros, thinking he was being ignored, then imprisoned all British subjects in Ethiopia in a bid to get Victoria's attention. It worked. He got his response, just not the one he wanted. It was lukewarm, and the diplomat carrying the letter didn't have the power to negotiate. See, from the British perspective, this idea of a crusade was not in any way attractive. The British textile industry ran on imported Egyptian cotton, and the government wanted the Ottomans as an ally against Russia. So Teodros ignored diplomatic immunity and threw the letter's deliverer into prison with the others. Then, when he received an ultimatum threatening an invasion if he didn't release them, he ignored that. A sort of fatalism had set in. Torn from within and without, neither Teodros nor his reign would survive. Defeated easily by the British force, his dissolving army withdrew to the new capital he'd founded. Refusing to surrender, and the last of his men dying from artillery barrages, he released his British prisoners unharmed and killed his Ethiopian ones. When they found him, he was dead, killed by a self-inflicted gunshot. He'd used the dueling pistol Queen Victoria had sent as a gift. But though his work remained incomplete, Teodros II had laid the groundwork for Ethiopia to become a modern state, one that would survive the scramble for Africa, because the British didn't stay, and Ethiopia's next great king was already active. Teodros' adopted son, former captive and child of his enemy, Menelik II, who would soon defeat an Italian invasion and win lasting security for Ethiopia. And since the story of the Ethiopian Empire is so vast, we're actually extending this series one more episode. But there's no way we could start that epic conclusion on an empty stomach. Alright, looks like HelloFresh has us covered again. HelloFresh is a tasty meal kit delivery service that's been saving me a ton of time this summer while also helping me avoid stressful meal planning and expensive trips to the grocery store while I'm hangry. That never ends well. Instead, I get everything I need to prepare awesome home-cooked meals delivered right to my door, and I'm eating in a half hour or less. And now with more than 55 different meal options available each week, finding your favorite is super easy. Want to go for vegetarian, pescatarian, or fit and wholesome meals? Oh, they got you covered. Myself, however, I went a more meaty route and cooked up their delicious one-pan pork carnita tacos, which Zoe and I devoured quite quickly while we hid inside from the Daystar. But since it's cookout season, Jeff grilled up their firehouse cheeseburgers, which of course looked too good for Zoe and I not to slap on sunscreen and make an appearance for. You said it, pal. 
Oh, and another thing HelloFresh gets right is their continued work on the sustainability and freshness fronts. Their produce goes from farm to your front door in under a week. The ingredients are pre-portioned, meaning less food waste when compared to grocery shopping. And HelloFresh is the first carbon neutral meal kit company, which we love to see. And with the summer in full swing, now's a great time to try HelloFresh for yourself with this delectable deal. All you gotta do is go to HelloFresh.com and use the code extra credit 16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes, three free gifts, and free shipping. Oh, you heard me right, hungry peoples. You can get free food while supporting the content you love, the environment, and your grumbly tummy. Again, that's 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts at HelloFresh.com using the code extra credit 16. Your time and taste buds will thank you. And once again, so will we. Thanks so much for the support. The biggest EC thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Muscia, Dominic Valenciana, and Joseph Blaine for being legendary patrons.